He Jump 2 was an aerial research mission dispatched to the far north early in 1952 by the United States Navy. This was the site of Ski Jump 2, where ice covers the Arctic Ocean and adjacent seas. The shortest air routes between Asia and the United States are the Great Circle routes over the Arctic, making this region important in the global defense of the United States. The purposes of Ski Jump 2 were to extend research and to perfect techniques started in 1951 by Ski Jump 1. The 1952 expedition sought answers to many questions concerning flying in the Arctic. For instance, what are the several large floating islands of the Arctic really like? Can they be of any use to the Navy? We want to know more about the Arctic Ocean, its depths and currents, its temperatures, salinity, and bottom characteristics. What types of ice are found here and why? How good are our techniques for operating heavy aircraft from nature's own ice strips? How will our latest ski wheel installation perform on natural Arctic ice fields? Under what conditions are skis necessary? The mother plane of Ski Jump 2 was a specially fitted Lockheed Neptune, a P2V. It left for Tuxent, Maryland on the 10th of February, 1952. This was the flying laboratory of the expedition, an R4D, one of the workhorses of World War II. It left for Tuxent on the same day. Two weeks later, the second P2V took off from Patuxent. It would alternate with the first P2V in serving as supply plane for Ski Jump 2. Seven days out of Patuxent, northern Alaska, and the Brooks Range. Before aviation, this mountain range discouraged movement farther north in Alaska. Next day, Point Barrow. For uncounted ages, Eskimos have lived here. In the last three quarters of a century, however, Point Barrow has become important to the United States as an Arctic outpost for military and commercial research development. The first P2V arrives over Point Barrow. It looks strangely deserted with the late day sun slanting over the lighted Quonset huts. Temperatures from 20 to 30 degrees below zero during this season keep most hands indoors. The P2V comes in for its first landing at the Barrow Airstrip. During the coming three months, one of the P2Vs will be seen here daily. The P2V is loaded with crew, cold weather clothing, spare parts, and survival gear. Let's take a look at Point Barrow, since the expedition will be based here. Here is an official Navy camp with a resident officer in charge. The camp is under the jurisdiction of Pet 4 the Navy project for developing petroleum reserves in this area. Other Arctic research projects, including the Arctic Research Laboratory, a weather station, and communication stations are here. Thus, Point Barrow aids the military and commercial projects in carrying out the United States policy. It was planned to begin Ski Jump 2 by establishing several oceanographic stations in the general area of 76 North and 145 West. Small amounts of reserve fuel were to be cached at two of these stations. From a station having a fuel cache, flights could fan out to more remote oceanographic sites without having to return to Point Barrow for fuel. Such stations were to be equipped with a small radio homing beacon with a one and one half watt transmitter powered by a wind driven generator. The station was also to have a 500 gallon cell for the gasoline cache. The 10 mile range of the radio beacon was too short. A much longer range is needed because the ice moves constantly and the beacon is seldom where the pilot expects it to be. A square search is often necessary to find it. This consumes valuable time and gasoline. For this reason, direct plane to plane fueling was adopted and fuel caches were established for emergency use. First, however, many local flights had to be made before the expedition could leave Point Barrow. These were to familiarize the crew with the area, to acclimate them, and to uncover any cold weather weaknesses in the plains. This experimental landing strip is two miles offshore from Point Barrow. On one of the familiarization hops, a trial landing was made on this strip. 
Combination ski and wheel landing gear are seen here. In this type of landing, on smooth ice with a light snow cover, the skis are raised and only the wheels are used. It was not unusual to return to the Barrow airstrip after one of these local hops and find a new cold weather problem. These problems, ranging from minor leaks of various types to an engine change, resulted in a one-month shakedown period prior to beginning actual operations. Oil leaks were a constant problem, and they were hard to locate, because it was necessary first to remove the congealed oil, a hard job in temperatures that dropped to 30 degrees below zero. Also traceable to the cold was the air fuel induction system fire that made this engine change necessary. Low temperatures caused hydraulic fittings to leak, clamps to loosen, and tools and materials to become brittle. Small tools snapped during normal usage. The mechanics usually wore light leather or nylon gloves and used Herman Nelson heaters to achieve some degree of efficiency and comfort while doing maintenance work. Even so, repair jobs took three to four times longer than normal. All maintenance facilities available at Barrow, such as this portable work shelter, were pressed into use. This was necessary because no special maintenance gear had been brought by Ski Jump 2. Finally, preparations are made to depart. Aircraft are fueled from 50-gallon drums by means of a portable gasoline-driven pump. To keep its weight down, each plane is given only enough fuel to complete its mission with a two-hour reserve. Frost is removed from the wings with ordinary brooms. Engines are turned up for half an hour before takeoff. About 25 minutes are required to bring pressures and temperatures up to normal. Here, the R-4D takes off for the expedition's first day of actual operations. Since the P-2V has a faster cruising speed, it departs later than the R-4D, so that both planes will be over the point of intended landing at about the same time. Aviation crews, oceanographers, and geophysicists, 10 highly trained persons per plane, depart for the site of the first oceanographic station. Off Barrow, the planes fly over the shore lead. The Arctic sea smoke seen here is caused by relatively warm open water coming in contact with cold air. During all flights over ice, the pilots and scientists keep a log of ice conditions. One hour before the scheduled rendezvous, the R-4D begins transmitting homing signals. These are continued until the P-2V comes within visual range. Once the rendezvous has been made, a search will be started to find a suitable landing area. Ice thickness is indicated by its color, but it takes a lot of experience before one can estimate its thickness with any high degree of accuracy. The lighter R4D lands first. The first job is to check the thickness of the ice. This is a crucial moment, and the plane is kept ready for instant takeoff in case the ice is too thin. When the saw starts bringing up water, the ice thickness can be measured. To support the loaded P2V, it must be at least four and one half feet thick. And the field must, of course, be long enough and smooth enough. This field passes the test, and the P2V is cleared for landing. Unloading starts, and the first oceanographic station gets underway. Survival gear is one of the first items out. Gasoline heaters are used, both to preheat the engines and to heat the cabin. Although these heaters are satisfactory, the fire hazard is a continuous threat. Survival equipment is placed some distance from the plane, just in case the plane catches fire or goes through the ice. After the engines are secured, banjo covers are put on for protection from cold winds and snow, and York heaters will be used to keep them warm. This auxiliary power unit, mounted on a sled, will be used as a source of electrical power. This 500-gallon neoprene gasoline cell will be filled and left as an emergency cache. The scientists begin collecting their data. Here, a geophysicist measures the force of gravity with a graviometer. About three hours later, with fueling completed, the P2V warms up for the return trip to Barrow. It will return tomorrow morning with fuel and supplies for the second oceanographic station. Even on this unimproved ice field, the big plane takes off without difficulty, where, as in this instance, 
snow cover does not warrant the use of skis, normal takeoff procedure is used. It is now the following morning, and the P-2B is returning to its rendezvous. The R-4D gets into the air as soon as the P-2V is sighted, and the two planes proceed to the general area where the second station is to be established. A suitable landing area has been found. The pilot sets the R-4D down very gently, feeling out the surface. Should the ice feel unsafe during this run out, he would make a touch and go for further investigation. In this case, the pilot is satisfied with the condition of the ice and makes a full stop landing. Out comes the power saw for measuring the ice. It is thick enough to support the P2V. The P2V taxis close alongside for fueling the R4D. During fueling, survival gear is removed from the plane. The auxiliary power unit is set up and preliminary work is done to establish the second oceanographic station. Meanwhile, the oceanographers commence their work. This power driven auger drills a hole through the ice so the oceanographers can collect their data. The shelter is then rigged over the hole and the doorway of the plane. Heat from the plane keeps the hole, the water samples, and the scientist's hands from freezing. At each landing, ice conditions in the general area are studied. Here, one of the pilots is approaching a rope pack. A rope pack is a kind of pressure ice, a pinnacle or slab that has been forced into an upright position, sometimes as high as 30 feet. Other types of pressure ice in the area form interesting patterns. These surveys train the pilots and navigators in estimating ice conditions accurately from the air. Ice crystals such as these often occur in the Arctic area. Certain combinations of atmospheric conditions cause sublimation, that is the change from vapor to solid, without going through the liquid state and these delicate ice flowers are the result. Landings on natural ice fields are safe only during good visibility. On a bright day, even small snow drifts are easily distinguished from the air. But in haze or overcast, ice and sky may blend together to form a whiteout in which no horizon is visible and pilots might not be able to see a pressure ridge such as this from the air. The P2B prepares to return to barrel. Normally, two or three hours are needed to bring the work of an oceanographic station up to this point. But several more hours will be needed to complete the work. The first four oceanographic stations were set up in this manner. On the 26th of March, the P2V left Point Barrow to rendezvous with the R4D. The two planes then flew in company to the proposed site of the fifth station. Up until this time, all landings had been made on large areas of winter ice. That is, ice less than one year old, relatively smooth, with little snow cover. It makes the most desirable landing sites on the ice pack. However, north of the fourth station, areas of winter ice suitable for landing became scarce. Therefore, an ice field more than one year old had to be used for the site of the fifth oceanographic station. The P2V gets ready to let down as soon as the R4D has landed. A radio message from the R4D advises that the area is rough. It is rough. And the landing strip is too short. The pilot tries reverse pitch braking, but the plane goes into a sideways skid. Smoke pours out of the port engine nacelle. The R4D crew runs to lend a hand. Luckily, the fire is only a small one and is quickly put out. That reverse pitch didn't work very well. The left propeller went into reverse first and stuck there. The right would not reverse at all. This caused the plane to swerve, skid sideways through the drift, and damage the port ski. However, the bottom of the ski is not damaged, so a takeoff may be possible. The left prop has been restored to normal functioning, and the P2V is warmed up. Despite the damaged ski, the decision is made to attempt the takeoff. It works all right. Notice how cleanly the skis slide. They hold the wheels clear of the snow most of the time. This ski installation is the result of three years experimentation and testing. One recommendation resulting from Ski Jump 2 is that this ski installation be accepted as a model installation on any large aircraft using tricycle landing gear. For ski takeoffs in the P2V, full flaps, 
full nose up, elevator trim, and full power with water injection is used. Ski takeoffs are quite similar to seaplane takeoffs in that a definite hump speed is encountered. As soon as the aircraft becomes airborne, the elevator is returned to neutral trim. Once more, the P-2B heads back to barrel, and the R-4D crew and the scientists turn to setting up an oceanographic station. Next morning, during a takeoff, the R-4D ran out of luck and struck a snow-covered ridge, collapsing the left landing gear. Shearing off the left propeller and buckling the outer panel of the left wing, Point Barrow radio informs the maroon crew that rescue will be delayed several days because of P-2V troubles. The crew immediately set up their survival gear and begin sorting out what equipment can be taken and what will have to be left behind. Instructions are received to clear a landing strip for the P-2V. All hands help level snow drifts and small ice hummocks. After the runway is smooth, it is marked with bright red flags. Never had any plane looked so good to the handful of men of the flying laboratory. A signal fire is started with burnable gear too heavy to be evacuated by air. The smoke helps the P-2V to keep the spot in sight and enables the pilot to judge wind conditions. Circling the area, the pilot comes down low and looks over the landing strip very carefully. He brings the P-2V in slowly because this is a very short runway. He is holding the nose wheel off the ice to keep it from pounding and to increase drag. The strip is still not smooth, but compared to its condition when the first landing was made, it is much improved. Safely down, the big plane taxis back to the stricken R-4D. It hurts to abandon this faithful plane, but it's the only practicable solution. The men in gear from the R-4D are returned safely to Point Barrow. But now, with the loss of the R-4D, the oceanographic phase is stopped. Two secondary phases of Ski Jump 2 remain. Investigation of the ice island, T3, and the ice survey of the area around Thule, Greenland. One P-2V leaves Point Barrow bound for the last known position of T3, which was about 120 miles from the North Pole. She is followed closely by her sister plane. After flying over an apparent endless Arctic wilderness, Ice Island T3 is sighted. Its gently undulating surface is easily distinguished from the surrounding sea ice. Most of the shoreline is characterized by cliffs from 20 to 30 feet high. The Air Force Project Icicle had landed and made a small camp on T3 17 days earlier. Snow cover of two to four feet makes ski landings necessary. Since the Air Force has started a landing strip, the P-2Bs are provided with a proven landing area. This is the final test of the P-2B ski installation. Since the landings at Station 5, the inboard runners have been reinforced. The skis are now highly successful. The Air Force welcomes the Navy aboard. The Air Force camp consists of a large tarpaulin-covered snow cave and several mountain tents. Three hours are spent at the camp discussing the island and its possible uses. The island is believed to be of land ice origin. Its center is about 50 feet above sea level, indicating that the island is about 400 feet thick. A decision is made for the two P-2Bs to fly over the nearby North Pole. However, shortly after takeoff, one P-2V experienced a valve failure and had to return to T-3. Bits of fractured metal in the engine made an engine change necessary. This meant a long wait until the new engine could arrive. The other P-2V was instructed to proceed directly to Thule so that scheduled operations might continue. The route of this plane took it from T-3 to Thule and back to Point Barrow. Meanwhile, there was work to be done on T-3. The Navy crew turned to and built their own quarters. Survival tents were erected and construction of a James Way hut begun. These 16-foot square huts, which resemble Quonsets, must be built on a level plot. The plywood floor sections are bolted together. Wooden frames and stringers are then put in place. And end walls are erected. The covering consists of two layers of canvas, 
separated by one and one half inches of fiberglass insulation. Several utility structures were built almost entirely of snow blocks. These blocks were sawed out and tailored to fit the structure. After two weeks, a new engine arrived. After four frigid days of round-the-clock man-killing work under most unfavorable conditions, the P2V is ready. She takes off on the last two phases of Ski Jump 2 and flies the 120 miles to the North Pole. A landing is not made because neither a suitable landing site nor cover aircraft is available. The P2V proceeds to alert on the northern tip of Ellesmere Island to Thule and then back to Point Barrow. A survey of ice conditions is made along the way. And so Ski Jump 2 came to an end. The project increased the fund of information about the ice islands, about characteristics of the Arctic Ocean and its currents, and about ice conditions in the Arctic. By means of Ski Jump 2, the Navy made its final evaluation of its P2V ski installation and perfected the technique for operating heavy aircraft on unknown ice fields.